thank you. Uh, it's uh, tonometry is become part of our lives. We have to do tonometry, whether the, it's a child, whether it is for a screening procedure, and there are many more new tonometers which are coming up. But why? What is the need for these newer tonometers? We all are. No, we all know now. Refractive surgeries has definitely exponentially it's increased, and although the gold standard is the GAT, it no longer ca is viable for this, these particular conditions. The need for topical anesthesia, is it known that, you know, before topical anesthesia came up, they were, the optometrists were not allowed to touch the patients because they were not allowed to put topical anesthesia. So that is why when cocaine came up, only after that the newer tonometers, the tonometers which we are using now also came up. Besides that, there are many conditions where we want to pressure, measure the pressure in cornelidema, opacities in children, IOP after silicon oil or other um, uh, types of vitreoretinal procedures and we all know by various studies that intraocular pressure is the risk factor of glaucoma and only factor by which we, we can treat it. So let's go on to one of the newer ones. I say it now itself that most of us, I included, we don't have this. I have taken this presentation, I have taken the video from one Dr. Kishore Pahuja who, from Pune who has been using this for a long time. So if you realize that this particular ocular response analyzer has has got an air tube, it's got a collimation detector and an infrared emitter. So how does it work? Just let's have a look at the video. Sorry. So this is how it starts fixating on the patient's eye and then after that when, once the air pulse, it's a non-contact tonometer, air pulse goes onto it and it aplanates the cornea and then after that again a second aplanation takes place. At that time the cornea dips further down and, and a second aplanation comes down. That's a second aplanation and once it's a peak explanation then it can be, then you get therefore two aplanation curves. Now if you notice that uh, this is the first aplanation and this is the second and between the two of them you get a factor which is known as the corneal hysteresis and hysteresis is one important factor which is coming into practice and in the years to come it will take a large uh, amount of your, I mean we, uh, uh, time will be taken on uh, ensuring that ocular hysteresis uh, is, uh, will be in, in your practice. So I'm not going into this, but this is how the Myers look. And we know that therefore there's a rapid air impulse which is forces, it applies force on the cornea and there's a collimated air impulse which moves the cornea inwards causing an aplanation. It deforms the cornea, cornea goes, becomes slightly concave, the air pump shuts off, the pressure reduces, the cornea then starts returning to its original shape and repasses through aplanation. And this entire deformation process is monitored by the electro optical detection system, which is an air, a, a infrared system. It monitors corneal curvature in the central three millimeters. So this, the difference between the two of them, as you said, as I've showed, that between P1 and P2, that's the two aplanations, is corneal hysteresis. An average of two aplanation events results in a repeatable. And this is one very good thing that the, if you get a repeatable Goldman correlated IOP measurement. So I just to show you a couple of waveforms that this is of a healthy patient, approximately it is 11.7. And the corneal hysteresis in normal population in most eth ethnicities is approximately 10. But suppose a person has been diagnosed with glaucoma, you find that the corneal hysteresis is much lesser. And in a person who is already progressing on medical therapy, you find that it is even lesser, it is 7.3. So you can get a lot of information. Now this corneal hysteresis is repeatable and individualized. It strongly correlates between right and left eyes. It is much lower in people with corneal disorders like Fuchs, Keratoconus and of course glaucoma. And we, they have found, that is Broman and LH have found, that GAT and OIOP G, they show very good correlation. It does not significantly vary throughout the day, which is a huge problem with us when we are just doing intraocular pressure. And we find that corneal hysteresis may be strongly correlated with glaucoma presence, glaucoma progression, 
and also effectiveness of glaucoma treatment than central corneal thickness. Another study which shares this says the same thing. ORA can be done also in children and in children by this study they have found that it's approximately 12.5. It is markedly lower in children who are having congenital glaucoma but when the child has nystagmus you can't do it with an ORA. Now this is again this machine is in RPC Ames and I've taken it from there. Now again this is a non-contact tonometer by which there's a rapid air puff by non-contact tonometer. The reaction of the cornea you just see how the cornea now the air puff comes over here and then the cornea starts dipping and here is how the dip takes place. Here. And now the images instead of being caught by infrared is now being caught by the shim flood camera and that takes about 4300 images. Now these are uh, as I said horizontal shim flood images are taken and based on 140 images which are taken in 31 milliseconds after the onset of air pulse then it gives a detailed assessment of corneal biomechanical properties which again is something which is coming up and we all need to know it. Now. Now comes another tonometer which is a one of the newer tonometers which is probably also going to come up in the newer in the years to come the dynamic contour tonometer. Now this measures intraocular pressure it is independent of corneal rigidity or thickness curvature or any of the elastic properties of the cornea. It can also measure short term fluctuations. Now this is the a corneal tonometer, the dynamic corneal tonometer. I would like you to have a look at the tip which is there, which is a concave shape and the tip is minimally, it only minimally distorts the cornea and this is, let's say this is the cornea and this is the tip, it has got a piezoresistive um, uh, uh, sensor which is present within the tip and this is able to measure it. So let's have a look. So when now the contours of both the cornea and the tonometer match, then the pressure is measured at the surface of the eye. And just to have a look at a video, I'm sorry, ma'am, can I continue? Or? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, now I have lost it. I, I, I don't know where I have lost it. Please, can you just, can, can you just go back? Yeah. yeah. So just have a look as to how the, the Pascal tonometer, this is, by the way, used on a slit lamp. Now you push the cap very firmly against the tip. I believe caps are not available these days. However, now this tonometer, you turn the Pascal on and you allow the tonometer to go across and you see, just see how the contact area that is there, the black circle, which it do not, you don't center the pupil, but the contact area is on the sensor and it gives you an audio that, okay, you are probably not correctly placed and therefore you move the lever arm slightly ahead and then you get, uh, uh, it just measured it for a few seconds and you get the actual intraocular pressure. Okay, ma'am. So the CCT plays a much lesser role, role in DCT, but it is said to be more time consuming, it is more difficult to perform and IOP remains with the DCT unchanged after LASIK which is of great importance to us because we are going to get patients who have undergone LASIK and therefore we need to know how to do this and there is less intra and inter uh, observer uh, to, uh, uh, variability. Tonopin all of us know, I am not going to go into it, only one thing that it can be used for children, it can be used in irregular corneal surfaces, corneal with pathology, very useful in the OT. All of us are using it when EUA on supine patients can be also used, recorded on bandage contact lenses, very useful for people who have got corneal burns, neurotrophic ulcers, in screening camps, but in hard surfaces like you've got a band keratopathy, it overestimates the intraocular pressure, also good for measurement of IOP in gas-filled eyes. You got the rebound tonometer. This is the newer model of the rebound tonometer. And this, uh, I'll just show you a video which, mm, leave it I think. Advantages of this is that there's no maintenance, no calibration, regular services required. No anesthesia, which is very great important. It is a very low cost. It hardly costs three and a half lakh rupees. It's portable and it's suitable for patients with disability which we do get people of dementia coming to us in larger numbers, we can do it for them. Even screening at home, measurements at different corneal locations, suppose you've got a central corneal ulcer, you can take it from the side also and you can get reliable IOP readings. There are just some pictures of home tonometers. This is the only transpalpable corneal tonometer, but, uh, which is non-corneal, sorry. It's called the diatin 
and it measures, it's, as I said, the only non-corneal tonometer in the market. We cannot get a hold of it, so I can't show you because it only can be bought. So uh, the, there's another tonometer which can be hold, used at home, that is the e Occutone tonometer, and this is another eye care home tonometer which can be used and it's used most comfortably with the uh, patients, especially for people who are showing progression, we can use it so that we can come to know what happens. And of course, everyone has heard about the Sensimet, the Triggerfish, which uh, people have used. I've used it. I don't really find it very, very effective. It's an expensive tool. We really don't know how to correlate the volume changes which take place in the aqueous with the IOB. I finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention.